The Isle of Man is, as the name suggests, an island. Go figure. Located in the middle of the Northern Irish Sea, the Isle is pretty much equidistant from the rest of the British Isles. In fact, there is an old man saying that if you were to stand on the summit of the Isle's highest mountain, Snaefell, you can see six kingdoms. Those of Man, Scotland, England, Ireland and Wales. The sixth, of course, being Evan. According to an old Irish folk tale, the formation of the Isle was said to have been the result of a quarrel between the Irish hero Finn McCool and a Scottish giant. In a bid to prevent the giant's retreat across the sea, Finn was said to have rent a great mass of clay and rock from the earth hurling it square at the giant to drown him mid-flight. But Finn overshot the great clod of rock and clay, landing square in the middle of the Irish Sea. Thus, the Isle of Man was created. Incidentally, this event also resulted in the creation of Loch Ney, a freshwater lake located about 20 miles west of Belfast. But, I digress... The folklore of Ireland will have its day in the sun. Mark my words. Now, over the centuries, the Isle of Man has seen quite the diverse mix of settlers, Gaelic tribes, Norse Vikings, and later, the Scots and the English. All of them bringing with them their own tales and legends, giving the folklore of the Isle its own distinct flavour. For many of the tales of mythic creatures and characters on this isle, but the one that concerns us today is that of the Bogain of St. Trinian's. So what the bloody hell is a Bogain, I hear you ask? Well, the general consensus is that in their natural form, they're a gigantic, airy, ogre-like creature or black fur, glistening fangs and burning red eyes, able to tunnel through the earth, causing tremors, wreaking havoc on human habitation. However, the Bagain could also be a subtle being, able to change its shape. It was even said that the fairy folk of the Isle would often employ the Bagain services to punish those who offended them. Now, sometime around the 14th century, a group of monks had come to the broad, rough meadow that lay between Greba Mountain and the High Road. Their intention to set up a church dedicated to St Trinian. But unbeknownst to them, the mountain of Greba that overlooked that rough meadow was home to an entity far older and more powerful than they could possibly have reckoned. The Bogain. And let's just say you were far from appreciative of the monk's efforts. I'll have no peace, no all day. The Bogain raged to himself. With all their chanting and jingling of bells. Nay. They finish their building. I shall have no peace. So the Bogain resolved to thwart the church's completion and vowed that never would the church of St. Trinian's bear a roof. Blissfully unaware, the monks carried on their godly work and after much effort and toil, finally the roof was set in place and the church was completed. But alas, they had not reckoned on the mischief of the Bagain. That very night, a terrible sound was heard coming from the church, as if a great storm were whipping through it. The next day, the good folk of Greba awoke to a disheartening sight, for the roof of the church had been utterly demolished. But the monks were a tenacious bunch and once again set to work, 
and after yet more labour and toil, the roof was once again set in place. However, the Bulgarian was just as tenacious, and as before, on the night of the second roof's completion, he set to smashing it to kindling. The wreckage was discovered the next day, striking fear into the hearts of the folk of Grieber, for they were now convinced that this were the work of the Bagain, and with a little more trepidation this time, they made one last attempt at repairing the roof. Now, about six miles from Grieber, there lived a talented young tailor named Timothy Clucas. But despite his talents, he were exceedingly poor. He had not a pot to piss in, you might say. He'd heard of the plight of the folk of Grieber, and in this he saw opportunity. Taking up a bolt of good cloth, scissors, needle and thread, he made his way to Grieber, and there made a strange wager that when the roof was repaired, he would spend a night in the church, and as a sign that he had done so, he would also make a pair of breeches. An odd wager for sure, but one the folk of Grieber were eager to accept, for they believed that if the roof stayed on for one night, then it would stay on in perpetuity. So it was on the evening of the roof's third completion that our Timothy made his way to St Trinian's. Boldly he entered the church, scanned around to make sure all was well, marched up to the chancel and after lighting a couple of big altar candles, he seated himself, put on his thimble and began work on the breeches. The first few hours passed without incident. Paying no heed to the fast-fading light, he persevered with his task, his fingers moving back and forth with skilled rapidity. Utterly focused, spurred on by the reward that awaited him. But outside the wind began to howl, and briefly the ground began to shake. Timothy paused cast his gaze beyond the chancel, staring into the darkness. But seeing nothing, he returned to his work, muttering, Bah! Tis foolishness, all this talk of the Bagain. Nonsense and superstition. At that moment, the ground shook again, more violently this time, as if something was rending its way through the earth beneath the cold church stones. Suddenly, not yards from where Timothy was seated, something exploded upwards in a torrent of earth, dust and splintered stone. Timothy glanced up for the first time concerned. A great head stared back at him, its eyes burning like embers in the blackness of the church. Unfazed, Timothy returned to his stitching, though he made sure to quicken his pace. Just a little. Through a cracked, tusked mouth, the Bagain spoke. Thou rascal! What business hast thou here? Timothy paid it no mind, his attention utterly devoted to his craft. Dost thou not see this great head of mine? Roared the Bulgain. Not looking up, Timothy replied. I see, I see. Very impressive, but uh, I'm going to continue with my work if you don't mind. Once again, the ground shook as the Bulgain heaved itself upwards. Up came two broad shoulders, then a thick arm ending in a boulder-like fist. Shaking it just inches from the tailor's face, the Bagain growled. Dost thou not see my long, thick arm? 
Pausing only to snuff out a guttering candle, Timothy replied, Aye, aye, I see it, very nice, very nice. If you don't mind, I'm going to... I'm going to crack on. And once again, he went on with his tailoring. Enraged, the bugain pulled himself further out of the hole. His vast body casting a shadow over Timothy. Dost thou not see this great body of mine? The bugain roared in frustration, enraged at the tailor's seeming lack of fear. Aye, aye, I see that, but here, I'm busy, so if you don't mind, replied Timothy, without sparing the beast a second glance. Dost thou not see my great cloven hoof? Snorted the bugain, drawing up one massive foot and slamming it down before the tailor. I see, I see. Timothy snapped back, his hands working faster and faster now. In an incandescent rage, the Bagain screamed, Dost thou not see my thick arms, my great talons, my broad fists, my... Cutting the Bagain off mid-floor, Timothy sprang up, pulling the last two stitches tight, and without a word or second glance backwards, he bolted towards the nearest window and leapt out into the night. He was barely over the churchyard wall when he heard the great crash as the Bugain's vast form erupted through the roof of St Trinian's, sending a shower of splintered wood and broken beams flying through the air. Clutching the newly made breeches tight, Timothy made a dash for it. The Bugain in hot pursuit, roaring furiously as he bounded after the nimble tailor. Its great long strides fast claws in the distance. But our Timothy were a canny one, and he knew well that the Bulgarian could not set foot on our Lord ground. Like a man possessed, he sprinted up the Douglas Road, towards the Maroon Church, only a short distance ahead. And just as the Bulgarian made to snatch him up in one great swipe of its massive hand, the walls of Maroon rose up before him, and in one great bounding leap, the tail was up and over, safe on the alloyed ground of the churchyard. While the Bulgarian was furious, and in a fit of fiery rage and frustration, he tore his own head from his shoulders, hurling it over the wall after Timothy, where it landed at the tailor's feet and quickly vanished in a cloud of mist. Along with it, the Bagain, who was never seen or heard from again. Timothy had won the wager, and though a couple of stitches on the breeches were noted to be a little longer than was normal, no one seemed to mind. He returned to Grieber an hero, and as promised, was richly rewarded. As for St Trinian's, it were left ruthless. From that day on, it became known as Kiel Risht, the broken church. It stands in that meadow to this day, beneath the shadow of the Grieber mountain. Well, just goes to show you, pays to brush up on your needle craft, doesn't it? You never quite know when it'll come in handy. You know where I am if you need out. Just ring that bell and give us a thumbs up, eh? Have a good one. I'll be seeing you. Ooh.